Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So for announcements, homework six is posted. That's due this Wednesday, uh, November 15th. So take a look at that. That's on Canvas. And also the exam solutions are posted as well as the grades. So if you have any questions about the exam grades or the exam solutions, stop by at office hours and I'd be happy to chat about that. We will be continuing lab nine this week. That's the internet of things and the MQTT lab. So uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're done, then you don't have to show up. Um, if you're not done, then we will be there to help out. And I think the, the sign off sheet is due uh, the following week, not the vacation week, but the week after that. So that is posted on Canvas. You can take a look at those dates due there. All right, and I'll hold office hours right after class if you want to talk about anything. So during the last class, we finished up talking about strain gauges and uh, electronic gyros. And so today we're gonna to move on to current measurement and power measurement. We already know how to take voltage measurements with analog to digital converters. And so today we're gonna to look at how do you measure current? How do you measure power? And we're gonna start the internet of things section of the course. So let's jump right into that. All right, so here's where we are on the sensor Roadmap. We talked about temperature sensors, light sensors, magnetic sensors, strain gauges, and just finished up gyros and accelerometers. We're going to talk about the different ways to measure current and power. So let's start off with current. So one straightforward way of measuring current is using what's called a shunt resistor. So if you have a wire, some conductor, and you want to measure the current I through that wire, you can insert a resistor in that wire. Now let's call that the, the sense resistor. And it's usually a very low valued resistor placed in the path of current that, that you want to measure. And then you can measure the, the voltage V sense and you know the value of R sense so you can calculate I. That R sense resistor is usually very small. It's Depending upon the current you want them to measure, it might be down near one milliohm or all the way up to 10 ohms. Again, depending upon the current and the voltage sensitivity that, that you can measure. The advantages to using a sense resistor is it's really simple. It uses Ohm's law, it's, it's well-behaved, it's low cost. But the disadvantages, as you know, current going through a resistor causes a voltage drop. So if you can tolerate that voltage drop, your circuit's not affected by it, well, then that's fine. That resistor works well. There's also power loss in that resistor. So if you're building a really efficient circuit or if you have high current, then you're going to be dissipating some power in that resistor. and That could be bad. Um, also, there's self-heating of that resistor. So again, if you have a high current um, conductor you're trying to, or high current path you're trying to measure, then that resistor could get hot. And depending upon the tolerance of that resistor, the resistance might change. That means the voltage changes. That means that your current measurement could be off. There are a couple ways to use a sense resistor. Let's suppose you have some node voltage, the supply voltage. It's, you know, it's connected to some power supply and ground. You have current going through a load. You want to measure the current through that load then you could put the sense resistor on what's called the low side. It's the ground side of, of the load and measure vSense. And so this, this is an easy way to measure current. Um, you're measuring current through the load on the ground side. If, if you have a small resistor, which typically you want, so you have a low voltage drop across our sense, then you're going to need an amplifier to amplify that voltage to get a reasonably reasonably accurate measure of, of current. So you can use a differential amplifier. And so here, this differential amplifier, I'm just drawing as sort of an op amp, but it would really be some op amp circuit. 
you're trying to amplify up vSense to, to some output value. So the output would be AV, the voltage gain, times vSense, the input voltage of that amplifier. And then you calculate I. I is V out over AV. That gives you the, the vSense value divided by RSense. And there you go. You've got some reasonable output voltage to measure. It's been amplified up. And you can use a small resistor. And then you can calculate the current based on the output voltage. One advantage of using low side current sensing like this with that amplifier is that amplifier only needs to handle um, low common mode voltages or low node voltages. So common node, common, I should say common mode voltages um, are voltages that are common to both inputs of a differential amplifier. So for example, this amplifier, uh, it has a small voltage vSense, that's what you're trying to measure. Um, it's measuring the difference between its two input nodes, uh, but, but there's a common voltage and that common voltage is really close to ground, right? In fact, one of those inputs, the bottom input here is connected to ground, so it's zero volts. And since vSense is really small, the other input is also small, it's really close to ground. So amplifiers and op amps have a limitation on the, uh, highest positive and I guess lowest negative voltage that that you can have as an input to those amplifiers. So this is a really um, easy case to handle since the common mode voltages are low. Um, the high side current sense is when you put the resistor above the load. And so you're measuring the sense above the load at the supply. And so it, again, it's easy to measure current from a power supply to multiple loads. And so you can put an amplifier up there. It has gain AV. So again, the output voltage is AV times V sense. And so you calculate the current V out over AV over R sense. Um, for this, for, for a large V supply though, let's suppose that supply voltage is 30 volts then that amplifier would have to handle a common mode voltage of, of 30 volts. Even though the vSense is really small between those two inputs, the amplifier would have to handle the 30 volt common mode voltage. And some amplifiers will not handle that. So that might be a reason to go to uh, a, a, a low side current sense. All right. Now, so if you want to measure current to an individual load, this is easy to do. If you want to measure current to multiple loads, this is another good approach because below the amplifier and before the load, you could actually break off a voltage bus to multiple loads. And then you'd measure the combine, combined current from the supply to multiple loads. Um, up, up top here, that's, that's a little more difficult because usually your loads have grounds, let's suppose this is on a circuit board. Your your loads usually have a, a ground connection right at right where they're located on the circuit board. So so you'd have to route them all, all those grounds back to a a common node so that then you could have that current going to ground through the R sense resistor. Um, and as you've seen in your project in lab, if you start making ground not ground, even if it's you know tens of millivolts maybe above ground, that can cause problems. So you have to go through the design and see the advantages, disadvantages of low side current sense versus high side and, and choose one of those. Advantages and disadvantages to both. Everything's a trade. All right. So this is one way to measure current. Another way is to use a Hall effect measurement. So the current to be measure, cre measured creates a magnetic field and that magnetic field uh, can be measured by a Hall effect sensor. That's one approach to, to doing this. So here's the con the concept. If you had current through a wire that's wrapped around a kind of a broken split toroid here, you could use a Hall effect sensor to measure the magnetic field. That magnetic field would give you an indication of the current. There are integrated circuits out there that do this. So here's an integrated circuit. Here's that integrated circuit on a board. Uh, it, it uses the Hall effect approach. And in fact, you can buy these for pretty, pretty cheap. 
Uh, they're under five dollars, and um, this it's an example of a, of an IC that outputs a voltage proportional to current. So you could see here pins one and two. That's where the current goes in. Pins three and four. They're parallel together to handle higher current. That's where the current goes out. You apply VCC, you apply ground, and there you go. You have current measurement. It's interesting to look inside this integrated circuit. Here's the current path right here. On the other side, that's where you want the output voltage proportional to current. And you can see the current goes through this conductor. And then there's a Hall effect sensor right next to that conductor measuring the magnetic field. And then the rest of the chip looks like a Hall effect sensor. And this Hall effect sensor in this case measures the magnetic field, not as a switch. Like if you wanted to just sense a magnetic field, you have some Hall effect sensors that just act like a switch. This would be more of a ratiometric Hall, Hall effect uh, sensor. Oh, I got my desk beeping at me here. And if you look inside this chip, you should see some amplifiers that are maybe of interest. So you should recognize here's an op amp circuit that looks a lot like a difference amplifier. And here's another op amp circuit that looks like a non-inverting amplifier. And it is. So you can see these are all built into an integrated circuit. All right. OK, so now we have two ways to measure current. This, this is a very non-intrusive way to measure current because there's no shunt resistor to drop voltage. There is some resistance in that conductor, but it's likely less than if you had a shunt resistor measuring the same current. So now, now, now that we can measure current, uh, we can measure voltage with an A, A to D converter like you're doing in lab. We, we can measure power. We have voltage and we have current that are both measured values. So if you have, uh, let's say, a battery powering an electric motor, if you knew IL and you knew VL, you could calculate PL. And so you may have to do some kind of signal conditioning, like a voltage divider and a capacitor, to be able to measure the voltage across the motor within the measurement range, within the full scale range of the analog to digital converter. And then you could use a current sensor, like one of these Hall effect sensors, again, to uh, an analog to digital converter on the board on your microcontroller board. And now you have measured I, measured V. That's how you could measure power. And so power measurement applications are good for tracking energy usage. So if you're trying to track the state of a battery and you know the capacity of that battery, um, well, one way you could track battery energy usage is, is by um, measuring the voltage of the battery, but that voltage is going to change as the load changes on that battery. Um, but you could actually track uh, watt hours or however you want to track charge out of that charge or energy out of that battery using the uh, power measurement. You could also estimate physical load applied to a motor. So if you're uh, if you know the power delivered to let's say your electric motor in your project, you could um, you know, you can multiply uh, voltage current, get that power, and the power is going somewhere, right? Conservation of energy. So your motor has some inefficiencies in it. There's some friction in there. Um, you know, there, there's loss, but likely a majority of that power is being delivered to the load. So you could estimate that physical load applied to the shaft of the motor and determine how many watts are you delivering to your mechanical system. And this is also commonly used. Current sensors and voltage sensors are also commonly used for built-in test circuits or bit circuits. So if you have an electronic board or an electromechanical system that has some kind of controller in it, it's likely measuring current and voltage throughout the uh, in important parts in the system. For example, if you have some kind of critical electronic component in, on your board, you might want to measure current to that component. And if that current changes uh, more than a certain expected amount, then that component might be going bad and you might do some preventive maintenance on, on the electronics. Um, or you could actually find just a complete failure. The, some big functions not working about your electronic system, 
the built-in test could use current measurements and voltage measurements to find out what subsystem or what component on the board is not working. So those are common applications of power measurements and voltage and current measurements. All right. Can I ask, why do you um, connect the microcontroller in a uh, capacitor or in a voltage divider situation? Yeah, just so, so you get that signal of the capacitor so it's not as noisy or what? Yeah, the capacitor is there to reduce the noise. It's acting like a filter. So if there's any spikes caused by maybe this is a brushed motor, that capacitor okay. would suppress those spikes. And then the voltage dividers, because if this is a 12 volt power source and you have more commonly a five volt or lower full scale analog to digital converter, you have to you have to reduce that voltage proportionally. And that's what the voltage okay. divider does. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's what I wanted to say about measuring current and power. Does anybody have any other questions on that? We probably should have integrated this into your project. In fact, if you if you get amb ambitious, you can you can pick up one of these current sensors and uh, measure the current. Let's say from the from VSM through the from the let's see that would be the DC to DC converter delivered to your um, your board or your motor, and and you could actually use one of these current sensors, measure current, multiply it by power and no, multiply, multiply by voltage to get power in your microcontroller. And then as you, you know, uh, if you run your constant speed prop at a constant speed and you touch on the, the spinner to try to load the, the motor down more, you should see that power increase. If the motor's able to maintain that RPM, it's maintaining it with more power because it's driving, um, it's dissipating more power through friction. So. That would be interesting to do. I should add that for next year. Okay, so this finishes up electronic sensors. So we've we've talked about electronic sensors converting a physical quantity into uh, an electrical signal. And we've talked about the underlying principles and how these work and how to, how to use them, because it's usually useful to know a little bit about how the sensors work so that you know how to apply those sensors. Right? For example, we talked about temperature sensors and how a, a semiconductor-based temperature sensor is going to cover a certain temperature range. It's not going to be too high. You're not going to measure you know, the temperature of a flame with, uh, with a silicon-based temperature sensor. You might use a, um, a thermocouple to do that or an RTD to do that, depending upon the maximum temperature. We talked about light sensors and how there are low-cost photoresistors but those photoresistors are, are fairly slow to react. So if you need to react very quickly, let's say to um, uh, some kind of signal that's coming in via light and you're sending data over that signal, then you need to use something like a photodiode, which has high sense, higher sensitivity and reacts quickly. We talked about magnetic sensors and how to use those to detect magnetic fields. We talked about strain gauges and how strain gauges have a very small change of resistance. So if you want to do anything with a strain gauge, you're probably going to need an amplifier in your circuit. And we talked about accelerometers and gyros and um, how they work and how gyros have drift. And we're using an algorithm with accelerometers. We talked about this in lab to, to stabilize the, um, the pitch and the roll axes of the gyros, but yaw drifts. So that's where you might want to take a magnetometer and measure magnetic north or your magnetic um, angle in yaw so that you could stabilize. So all of these are examples, examples of if you know a little bit of like if you went out to buy a gyro, hey, I have an electronic gyro, I'm just going to determine yaw direction. Well, you need now you need a magnetometer. If you know how they work and you understand the, um, the details about them, it's easier to apply these to your application. And we talked about current and power today. So you, you understand that uh, putting in a resistor in series might or might not be a good option, depending upon how much current, what the current range is and how much voltage drop you can tolerate. 
And so electronic sensors usually require some kind of signal conditioning and voltage measurement. So that signal conditioning might be amplifying the signal. It might be um, reducing the, attenuating the signal uh, so that you have a reasonable range to measure voltage with, with an ADC. Okay, and then you can extend these interface approaches to other types of sensors. So if you run into, I don't know, a humidity sensor, right? You know, you're going to have some kind of either analog interface with a voltage that might or might not be big enough to measure with an ADC, or you might have some digital interface that you have to connect to a microcontroller uh, and measure using a serial port. So not trying to cover all sensors, but we're trying to just give you a, a, a taste of some of the problems that are associated with using sensors and capabilities that that once you know the capabilities of the sensors, then you might come up with some novel solutions for your products and projects. All right. So that finishes up sensors. And so we're going to move out of the analog and physical world into the virtual uh, internet world now with internet of things. Okay, so the title of this section, device communications using the internet of things. So if you have a a system, a project, a product that um, needs to get information from a sensor or is a sensor and needs to broadcast information or connect to some other computer system, or if you're just running a test and um, it's not practical to have wires running to a test and you need to communicate sensor data or status data or communicate command and control, the Internet of Things is a good thing to look at, good approach to look at to do that. Okay. So what is the Internet of Things? It's really networking devices beyond just PCs. So we've had networks for a long time, but recently because of integrated electronics and building small modules with capabilities like Wi-Fi, it's become really practical to network together low power, small devices, and, and a lot of them. Uh, and so we network these devices together to exchange data. And we do this between sensors and processors and microcontrollers and also human interfaces. So if you have a tablet that's just acting as a human interface, you can connect it to the IoT, the Internet of Things, and that would provide your, your human interaction. And so the data exchange, when we're talking about the Internet of Things, it can happen over the Internet, it often does, but it can also happen over other communications networks, like a local area network or, or something that's just um, standalone, like we're doing in lab. You see IoT mentioned a lot in products for home, autom home automation and home security. So heating, ventilation, air conditioning control is, is now getting a lot more common. So if you can control your house temperature on your phone, you're participating in IoT. Security systems are now often integrated with some kind of IoT, either for their the sensors, the security sensors, or for security system status. And um, Increasingly, I, IoT is being used for identifying uh, maintenance issues with appliances and um, furnaces and air conditioners, things like that. So it's it's getting used a lot in the home automation area. Transportation and logistics is also using IoT a lot for fleet management, so tracking trucks um, and also reporting maintenance from from vehicles and other devices. In the, in, the, in the chain that gets a product from somewhere to somewhere else, like your house. Delivery tracking is getting common. So if, if you have a, some kind of delivery vehicle with GPS on it, it can report um, its position. And then 
industrial, scientific, medical, agricultural applications are also becoming common. So monitoring weather conditions at different areas, soil moisture content in, um, in, in fields and in hydroponic farms, and also nutrient levels in, again, dirt and soil and, um, and hydroponic solutions. So lots of stuff going on in IoT that support not just, you know, fun projects, but also practically connecting sensors and compute resources and interfaces to the internet and they all exchange data. So we've, we've been able to connect computers to other computers and even microcontrollers to computers for a long time now. There's a couple types of networks I want to point out, uh, the point point to point network versus pub sub messaging, which is what we're doing in lab, pub sub messaging. And so if, if there are various point to point communications approaches, both wired and wireless. So if you have um, sensors like light sensor, moisture sensor, security sensor, and then you have uh, command and control or human interface devices like a laptop or a tablet, and then some kind of commute, uh, commute, compute or automation resources like an embedded processor. Right? Then, so you want all these things to communicate because they each have their function in your, let's say your, your sensor network. So the security sensor could start up and then um, connect to the laptop and the embedded processor and the tablet and make its own communication link there. And then the light sensor could also do the same thing. Again, connect to the laptop, connect to the tablet, connect connect to the embedded processor, and same thing with the, with the moisture sensor. So we'd have a lot of these individual point-to-point -point links that have to be established and maintained. So if they dropped, you'd have to start up those, those links again. And then all of these computing devices and processing devices probably also want to communicate so that the tablet can get status of whatever is being tracked at the embedded processor and the same thing with the laptop or the laptop would want to control the sensors. So the laptop you know, has to send, has to figure out what communications link do I use to, to reset the security sensor or to get data from the embedded processor. So there's a lot of connection establishment and maintenance here and tracking. But this approach of point to point comms is using individual connections. So you have to establish individual connections. And then you have to have a way of, of pulling data, like the PC requesting data from the processor. And maybe the processor doesn't have, the embedded processor doesn't have any new data, you know, and, but you're sitting there and pulling it just to see if it has new data. That would be a pull approach. Or the embedded processor could, um, could push data, like push data from itself to the PC, well, maybe the PC is not using that data at the time. So you know, you're taking up network bandwidth or, or uh, link bandwidth here. And you also have to manage connections. You have to manage disconnections um, and missing devices. So um, you know some, some systems, if you pull out a device and the, the architecture is depending upon that device, device, you might break. You might break the network. And so you know, what happens? Um, you have to handle that. The publish subscribe um, model, which we're using in lab, and there are benefits to this, disadvantages, but a lot of benefits. You have the same devices, but you add the broker. And so each sensor establishes a connection to the broker, and each computing or interface device establishes a connection to the broker. And then devices... Um, uh, these sensors can connect to the broker and publish data, or actually not just the sensors, but the, the computing devices. So they connect to the broker, publish data. The broker sends data to the devices that subscribe to the data, and the data is filtered using topics. So data producers publish to topics, and data consumers subscribe to topics. And in this architecture, uh, we'll talk about this, but it's 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 easier to um, maintain maintain and manage connections only to the broker, instead of having to maintain and and manage connections to multiple devices. 
that may or may or may not be there. And missing devices in a well-designed pub sub architecture don't break the system. And so let's talk about the, the um, pub sub protocol called MQTT. So MQTT is a lightweight publish, subscribe, machine to machine generally network protocol. So you have clients, there's a client on the left, a couple clients on the right, and then the broker in the middle. And so originally the, the term MQTT stood for MQ telemetry transport. And I've seen references where MQ stood for um, message queue. Some people said message query. So it's hard to find the origin of that. But now, but now today, for the last 10 years, MQTT does not stand for anything. So there's a bit of trivia. So if someone says, what's MQTT? You can't tell them what it stands for because it doesn't stand for anything according to, well, MQTT uh, standards. And so um, the protocol provides pub sub messaging, but there are no, it's not considered point to point message queues, despite the name MQ. And the history of this is interesting. It was developed actually a long time ago, what, um, in 1999. And it was originally intended to be a, a very low bandwidth, very bandwidth efficient, low power way to monitor uh, gas and oil pipelines via, via satellite links. So satellite is generally an expensive way to go for communicating data. Um, you, you pay for bandwidth, you pay essentially per bit. So it's, it's expensive per bit to communicate data like that. So if, if it's expensive per bit, you don't want to send too many bits. So you don't want a protocol like, like, um, like TCP IP over ethernet. Um, there are other protocols that, that are expensive. If you don't have a big pipe or, or data isn't cheap, you don't want to use a protocol that, um, that uses a lot of overhead to transport data. So MQTT was a way to cheaply transmit small messages of data from a, from a, a measurement point to some other place. And so in 2010, the IBM released MQTT as a free and open protocol, and it's actually managed by uh, OASIS, um, a standards organization. And so now you can see this, uh, this protocol was actually updated recently, 2019. So it's been maintained and it's being maintained by Oasis. And so now MQTT is um, pretty commonly used for Internet of Things to connect devices in a resource constrained system. So low power and low bandwidth. You're not, you might either be battery powered um, or uh, you, you might have a very limited bandwidth connection, like low bits per second. Um, but at the same time, MQTT is being used over high-speed networks too, like LANs and the internet. So it doesn't have to be constrained to low bandwidth communications. But if you're going to do high bandwidth communications, there's pr there are probably better ways to do that. Like I probably wouldn't figure out a way to use MQTT to send you know real-time video from a camera to someplace else. I'd probably use something else. Okay, so here's a here's an example, MQTT pub and sub. So you might have a couple sensors, temperature sensor and a light sensor. And so the temperature sensor is running client software and the light sensor, any sensor is running client software. Any client is running client software. And then you have a LAN or, or the internet and you have a broker. And so the broker is a PC or some computing device that's acting as the, the central point of this MQTT network. So the temperature sensor, once it's ready to publish its temperature, it publishes temperature data or any data to a topic, in this case, the temperature topic. And so that goes over the network and eventually makes its way to the broker. So the broker now sees, okay, I have received, pub, I, I've received data, I know the topic, and it knows who has subscribed 
to that topic. So the broker is going to send data to the clients that are subscribed to that topic. So here, this PC was subscribed, this client was subscribed to the temperature topic and it gets the temperature data that was published. And the light sensor could do the same thing. Light sensor publishes, that should say light sensor data to, um, to, the, the, to the brightness topic. And so that goes down to the broker. The broker says, oh, I have someone subscribed to that. I have a client subscribed. So the uh, client that is subscribed to brightness receives that light sensor data. Each one of these clients can publish and subscribe. So this temperature sensor, for example, if it needs configuration, needs to know, should I report in Celsius or Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit and how often should I report temperature? then you might want to configure that. So you could use a PC to publish configuration data and this temperature sensor could subscribe to that, to that configuration data. Um, so you could use sensor subscribing to be configured by a remote PC. And then each client can subscribe and publish to multiple topics. So the the PC could subscribe to temperature and brightness and other other configuration or other um, sensor data. Okay. So that in a nutshell is how the pub sub architecture works with MQTT. It's uh, let's take a look at what goes on behind the scenes in in the protocol and how it connects and then some of the the control that goes on so you know how this is working. So a typical way of using MQTT is a client connects to the broker. And then a client wanting to receive messages subscribes to one or more topics. And a client wanting to send messages publishes to one or more topics. And then when the client is done, the client can disconnect from the broker. So it lets the broker know, hey, I'm not here anymore. Don't send me anything. And actually, the the client has a way to, of 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 knowing also if it's connected. I'll show you that. So here's an example: a PC's running an MQTT broker connected to a Wi-Fi network, and then you have a laptop. We'll call that client A. And then you have a temperature sensor. We'll call that client B. And client A wants to subscribe to temperatures. Client B wants to publish temperatures. So let's let's take a look at um, at how this works. Okay, and I'm going to assume a quality of service QoS zero, which affects the message flow. I'm going to show you the message flow, the the data going over the network. Um, we'll talk about quality of service later, but this assumes QoS zero. Different qualities of service use different message um, schemes here. Okay, so here's a, a plot of time. Time is going down, and we'll show the messaging going on between the clients and the broker. So client A, you turn on the laptop, you want to receive temperatures, and so client A sends a connection uh, packet, control packet, over the network. The broker receives that control packet, and then it says, okay, I hear you. I know I acknowledge you are able to... Um, uh, be connected, and then it sends an acknowledgement back. So that's a connection acknowledgement. So now client A knows, okay, I have established a connection to the broker. Now I can subscribe. Now I can publish. I'm ready to go. Client B does the same thing. It sends a connect request to the broker, and the broker, again, it, there might be a username and password. That's a different protocol or a different uh, way of doing things here, but but the broker says, okay, Client B, you can you can connect, and here's an acknowledgement. The acknowledgement goes back to client B. Then client A, that who wants to receive temperature, subscribes. So it subscribes to the topic temperature underscore F. And the broker is going to acknowledge back. Okay, client A, you are subscribed. You can just sit there and wait. Expect that when anyone publishes to temperature F, temp Fahrenheit, you will get that or at least the broker will send the message. And then client B has something to publish and it just publishes right to the topic temperature underscore, to, underscore F and 
it has a message, the value is 72. And the broker, what it does is the broker actually uses a publish message, uh, a publish packet, I should say, to get that data to client A who has subscribed to temp underscore F. Okay, so that's, that is an example of connecting and an exchange between clients and the broker. So, so when you were doing things in lab, all this is happening with subscription when you've subscribed to something and for publishing messages um, when you were sending messages. And more than two clients can participate. And other clients can also publish to the same topic, in this case, temperature data using the same topic. So you could have client C, client D, they might be also temperature sensors. And so they can also publish to the same topic and then client A will see all of those temperatures. Other clients can subscribe to the temperature data. So if you had some other Raspberry Pi, other PC, um, multiple clients can subscribe to that same temperature data. So you can see how we're avoiding making these point-to-point -point connections. Um, everything's going through the broker. It makes it really easy to add clients, to add subscribers, and to add publishers using this architecture. Okay, and when more clients join, you don't have to change anything about the architecture. Um, or all clients leave or one client leaves, the whole communication process doesn't break. It's just automatically handled. If you just unplug client B unexpectedly, you don't have to like reset all the devices to get all the connections to happen again. And any client can be a subscriber and a publisher at the same time as we talked about. And so this is, this is the, again, the overview of quality of service zero, which is what I'll describe as fire and forget. There's no guarantee you're gonna get the message there. Um, but if you go up to higher qualities of service or use different features, you'll see there are additional packet types and fields um, for different purposes. That gives you an idea basically of what's going on um, in terms of communication over the network when you publish, subscribe, and connect. So there are MQTT clients for uh, PCs. And to use MQTT on a PC, you need um, client and broker software, or at least you need a broker somewhere that you can connect to. And so command line clients are the most common that I've seen for PCs. And they let you type in and view messages just like you're doing in lab. So you start up PowerShell, you start up command prompt, and you can use these clients. But also, like you're doing with your Arduino, client libraries exist so that you can use MQTT in your software, in your programs. You've been using a C version for Arduino of the client library. Um, there are also... Python libraries. So if you wanted to make a Python program that did command control status displays, you can get a Python library uh, that will that will do that. And so cl the client and the broker software can be run on different PCs, right? So I was watching up in front of the lab. I was subscribed to the broker on my PC, and you were publishing on 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 your PC or your um or your device or your or your project. And so you could do that separately, or you can run um, client and broker on the same PC. So if you had, for some reason, software that needed to communicate on the same PC, you could actually use this. And so we've looked at Mosquito. You have downloaded Eclipse Mosquito. That was the software available from our website and online at the Mosquito Eclipse Mosquito website. And it's, it's pretty popular. It's easy to use. It's simple. It's small. And it's um, it, it, and it's free. And I have run Mosquito on Windows and Linux, so I have noticed that on Windows, some of the features are restricted. On Linux, if I need those additional features, I, I'll just start up a virtual machine um, on my. I'll start up a Raspberry Pi or a virtual machine on my PC. If you're ever looking to run Linux, if for some reason you're using MQTT or anything and it would it would just work better on Linux, you can download software called VirtualBox that lets you install a Linux um, distribution like, like Ubuntu. 
and it'll let you uh, run at the same time you're running Windows. You can open up a uh, a virtual machine and run Linux, and I've I've done that often. There are free public brokers on the internet available for testing. There are some limitations. I think if you publish too much, it might lock you out. And sometimes they're intermittent. I've noticed that these brokers sometimes go down, but I've never had a time when all of these brokers were down. I've always had the opportunity to have one available. So in, in subscribing, you did this in lab. So this is the broker address, and the broker address can either be um, a URL, if you have some kind of name server that tr um, maps the URL to the, the IP address, um, or you can use an IP address directly. And then, of course, you supply the topic name to which you want to subscribe. To subscribe. And then publishing uses mosquito underscore pub for the mosquito client, dash H, Again, specifies the broker address, dash T specifies the topic, and then there's your message. So that's really convenient for, for testing, I've found. Okay. So here, here's a basic pub sub example using Mosquito. You have some kind of network or the internet. You you have some kind of broker sitting that out there on the internet. Here's test.mosquito.org, one of the public brokers. That's the IP address. You can look up, you can go to the name, name server lookup and look at the uh, IP address. And then uh, you connect subscribers. Here are connected subscribers. And here's your connected publisher. And each subscriber can subscribe using the command prompt, using mosquito underscore sub. And they can all subscribe to the same topic at the same time. And then when the connected publisher publishes Hello World, Hello World shows up at every subscriber. So this is a great way to also distribute data too. If you have multiple things that need to be commanded, you know, you could think of, um, you know, multiple autonomous vehicles that are connected to the internet and you need to distribute um, command data to them or configure them, this is a good way to do it. It doesn't matter how many are out there, you could send a message. And if they're all subscribed to the topic, you can get the configuration to those devices. All right. So the, uh, the protocol is performing a lot of behind the scenes activities and exchanging control packets in a very specific way. And so these activities behind the scenes include acknowledging connections, verifying connections are still present, implementing security, and implementing a specified QoS, quality of service. And so if you go dig, if you dig into the standards, you'll see there are many different control packet types. And so you can see here's connect and the connect act that we talked about. Here's publish. Uh, here's subscribe and subscribe ACK that we talked about. Okay, but there, there are these other um, control packets that you can use depending upon your if you're going to a different quality of service or if you're using security features. So you can use MQTT in a simple way, for example, no passwords, or you can customize an application using the more advanced capabilities. For example, we're going to talk about um, higher qualities of service where actually the publishing of a message is acknowledged. Okay, that would be quality of service one. And then when you go to quality of service two, it actually um, uh, uses these other messages here. Many clients actually use this ping request and this, this uh, ping response. So a ping is when you're just asking a device to respond with something, anything. Let me know you're there. So what a client can do is if you if you set up a sensor and, and the client's sitting there publishing information, it might ping every once in a while to make sure it's still connected to the uh, to the broker. So that's what the ping request and ping response is. And then you could uh, you can have sensors disconnect, right? So the the broker doesn't have to um, maintain any data on that client anymore. 
So all this is going on behind the scenes, and we'll we'll take a look at some more details about this. We don't want to dig in too much, but sometimes it's helpful to know what's going on behind the scenes, it, so you know what capabilities are there, so so you know when you want to implement MQTT in a product or a project, it's all available. Okay, so it looks like I'm coming up on the the wall on time here, so let's end class here today. So homework six is posted. It is due on Wednesday. So check that out. That is on Canvas. Lab nine continues this week. If you've already finished, um, you, you don't have to come to lab this week. If you want to work on your project more, we'll be there to help. And um, we'll continue on that. We'll start a new lab after Thanksgiving break. Uh, check Canvas for all the due dates and due times. They're all posted. I will hold office hours right after class if you'd like to join. So uh, stop on by if you have any questions or would like to talk about anything. If not, I'll see you next time and have a great night.